All right, so I think we can start. So hello everybody, uh, welcome to another Sales Raz webinar or SEO ZRAZ. As you can join uh, this event hashtag uh, on Slido and ask us questions. Today uh, we are having Ren Fishkin from Spark Toro here from the from the US. And uh, we'll be talking about zero click searches and how Google is retaining more searches uh, to their properties and, and not providing us the clicks that we need. So hello, Rent. Welcome. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for having me. And um, let me start with just maybe a question, short introduction. What does uh, SparkToro uh, do? And what's the tool about and what, what kind of agencies or what are your clients that use sure. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, yeah, I obviously started a company called Moz, which many folks in, in sort of the SEO and search marketing world know um, a long time ago, I think almost as long ago as, as you started Basta Digital um, and left that company three years ago and started SparkToro with my co-founder Casey. And what SparkToro is, is basically um, we crawl social and web data and aggregate those profiles together and then make that searchable. So if you want to find out, you know, what electrical engineers in Canada are listening to and reading and watching and what hashtags they use and how they describe themselves and what they talk about online, SparkToro can tell you that. And if you're interested in people who um, I don't know, are obsessed with supercars, you know, you can go and, and look for my audience uh, frequently talks about supercars and you can see what accounts they follow and which podcasts they listen to and uh, what YouTube channels they subscribe to. And then maybe if you have a product or something that you want to market to them, you can reach them through those channels. So it's essentially helping people break out of the Google and Facebook duopoly, uh, find more opportunities across more marketing channels of all kinds, and get lots of you know, interesting and useful affinity and demographic data about the customers that they want to reach. Thank you. And uh, let's talk about Google search. So I think first other services than search uh, started to appear in maybe 2005 to 2004 with introduction of uh, Google Local or Google Maps. Mm -hmm. And uh, later, of course, in 2007, uh, Universal Search that pushed images and videos and news and, and other, other services were coming to, to uh, Google Search and taking more space. But it took us um, maybe another 10 years. It took actually you as well 10 years to define this uh, behavior and, and, and call Google out on uh, zero uh, click searches. So why do you think it took us so long to kind of identify that we, we have been pushed to the wall regarding uh, how much traffic we can get uh, from, from Google and uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, my sense is Google was very strategic and very smart about this, right? They basically, you know, they built their Trojan horse, they rolled it up <laughs> to the walls of Troy, and it, it took us many years to sort of bring that horse inside. And, it, and then they, you know, they, they waited until we had let down our defenses um, to send in all these things. Uh, Universal Search is a really good example of this, right? So Google News, Google Images, um, uh, Google Video, all of those still sent traffic out, right, for a long time. And then, you know, a few years ago, Google, uh, I think it was 2014, Google made the change that almost no one except YouTube could ever appear in video. Right. And so so suddenly Google is preferencing their own stuff. And then for a long time, when you had a Google Maps listing, if you clicked on one of the you know local results, sorry, I got some uh, Navy jets because I'm here in San Diego and they're flying overhead. so loud um but so you would see those um those maps results and then if you clicked one of them you know if you search for a local italian restaurant you click on it you would go to the restaurant's website until 2015 2016 suddenly now you're going to the google maps page right so google is 
is slowly introducing these features. They're polishing them, they're refining them, they're getting one, everyone accustomed to them. They're making them quite high quality, right? They, they introduce something new and they give it time to become quite high quality. And only, only after all of those things do they start capturing all the traffic for themselves. Google Jobs is a great example right now. Google Jobs is sending a ton of traffic to many job listings and job websites, but for how long? Right? How long is it before Google becomes the center of that universe? Google Finance, they, they, you know, they took all those stock listings and they provide that data themselves now. Uh, Google Flights, right? they bought ITA and then they whoop, integrated it all. Google Hotels, Google um, uh, Color Picker, uh, Google Speed Test, right? they just sector after sector after sector, they grab and grab and grab. And I, Look, I think this is just the way it's going to go until or unless regulation steps in. All right, so that's that's a, a good topic about regulations. Uh, we have already had some tries here in Europe uh, regarding, I think, French courts decided yeah. that uh, Google has to pay for the news to news publishers. Also in Germany, I, I know there are similar laws in Australia, mm -hmm. and and other regulations. For example, recent cases were about Google Shopping when. Uh, Google was forced to uh, accept uh, their competitors and, and, and allow them to advertise uh, in Google Shopping for, for better prices than uh, the regular customer, let's say. And what do you think about these? I, I'm sure you can also provide us with some examples of uh, regulations in different states over the, over the US or in the US general. What do you think? Is, is this the right way how to um, work with Google in terms of uh, they are getting really uh, large. Basically, now they are covering, I don't know, in Slovakia, it's almost 100% of searches. And uh, in other countries worldwide, it's maybe less. It's maybe around, I don't know, 80%, 90%, depending on the country where we go. But what do you think about these regulative approaches? Is, is that the right way how to approach this situation? Or should we just wait for other players on the markets to grow bigger? Uh, so let's see. Uh, my, uh, my belief is that it is worth experimenting with, with significant regulation. I, I can't say for certain, right? I will not say that I am 100% sure that if Google is more carefully regulated or, or if they're broken up or if, you know, for example, um, there's some um, proposals from some folks in the US to make YouTube and Google and Google Maps three different companies, right? And so then Google has to determine, hey, does YouTube always have the best video or should we be showing videos from other places in our results? Why would we give a preferential listing to YouTube if we don't own them? I think that's really interesting. I think it's worth investing in um, and experimenting with. I don't know whether it will be absolutely effective, um, but there are, you know, there's, I believe, five regulatory uh, items that the U.S. House of Representatives, which is, which is sort of one half of our Congress uh, here in the U.S., that they have proposed a whole bunch of legislation that would affect Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and potentially anybody else who gets to kind of that, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars um, or above. I, I think, sorry, sorry, <laughs> 500 or 600 billion dollars or above, right? So, so only the, the, the most gigantic corporations um, in the United States, which are almost all tech companies now. And the, um, I think that the problem, Daniel, that you face is that it is nearly impossible for a challenger to come along and disrupt um, Google in their space or Facebook in their space or Microsoft or Amazon in their spaces. And that's just because they have built um, they have built systems, right? They've seen what happened to companies in the past over the last hundred years, and they have built systems to prevent any competitors from being able to enter their market, right? So if, you know, Amazon is a good example of this, where they have things like Prime and a whole shipping system built in, and no one else can use their shipping and delivery network, and no one has their scale. So Amazon can always both undercut prices in the short term and make up for it in the long term. 
and they can ship things faster and more reliably and more efficiently than any of their competitors ever could. How, how do you possibly become an online retailer, a generic, you know, large scale uh, online retailer and compete with Amazon? It, you know, you give them credit. They were smart about those decisions. They made good strategic choices, but it is anti-competitive, right? And, and what we have learned about democracies and capitalism from the last hundred years is when you have monopolies or, or duopolies, in a space, whether that's online advertising or retailing or transportation and logistics or, or oil and gas. Um, when you have monopolies, you have concentration of power, you have income inequality, you have political strife, and it usually leads to political violence. That, that all sounds terrible to me. I don't want any of those things. So I'm willing to do some things that might be short-term economic destructive, maybe even not good for us as consumers, in order to prevent those problems that monopolies create. That, that's my perspective. Everyone is welcome to have a different opinion, but I, I think and hope that, this, um, that these regulatory efforts are pretty significant and then we'll see what happens. You know, maybe in 10 or 20 years, we'll learn, oh, we, we didn't do it quite right. We should do it, we should do something else. But I think doing nothing is a path to um, more extremism and, and more significant problems and you could, I mean, I don't know how many of you paid attention to U.S. politics. The last five years have been very rocky here. Yeah, yeah. And definitely influenced by the social networks and the, yeah, surge. Yeah, and, and by, you know, access to information and information transparency and also income inequality, right? right. You, you know, you just have 1% of the U.S. that sort of owns almost all the wealth in the country and can buy and sell everybody else, right? And that... Right. That's not I great. Have, I have seen some uh, research recently because we have this uh, law in, in the EU that you, uh, when you are buying a, a new phone or a new computer, you, you, the, the, I mean, the operating system needs to offer you the selection of search engines. Yeah. But still, it's some kind of, I, I don't understand the, the, the mechanism like uh, exactly, but it's some kind of auction. So basically, what the research was saying that Duck, duck, uh, go would have to pay for their position to be listed in the auction. And if, if they are not paying enough, of course, they are not getting listed. So what, what do you think? I, I think this kind of regulation is failing or has been. Yeah, failing. it's 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 pretty silly. I think the, the problem is um, giving consumers choice after the market has already been dominated by a monopoly is not it's not real choice. No, yeah. you know, no one's going to say, I, I mean, look, credit to DuckDuckGo. It's a pretty good search engine. It works okay. Is it as good as Google? No. Yeah. Are we as used to it as we are used to Google? No. Now, it's okay for Google to be a monopoly in search. You know, it's, it's not ideal. I don't love it, but it's okay. The problem is when Google takes their search monopoly and goes into your sector, right? Basta Digital helps tons of clients in all sorts of sectors, right? All, all across Europe, and, and I think some folks in, the, in North America as well. And your clients get a lot of opportunity and a lot of traffic from Google. Until one day, Google decides to compete with them and take all that traffic opportunity away. And then what happens, right? Your, your client fires you because you can't do anything for them, right? Google's taken the top spots. Their traffic's cut by 80%. Their business is cut by 80%. They've, Google has trained all of the rest of us to rely on Google to find things. And so you, you just, you lose a tremendous amount of opportunity from all these sectors. And Google has to show their shareholders growth, right? And so if there's no more people to capture, if they have 95% market share, growing their volume of search is not going to help them. They need to enter your client sector. They need to enter your business's sector in order to get more revenue growth. Mm. So and, and, and the and incentives getting, are the problem. Yeah, and we are getting more dependent on them because now we have a local search and where, where we can have one button or maybe a link. But then, of course, people are searching for us at Google. So we need to have our presence there and once they click it, maybe they'll get to the map. So another zero click, they get all the information about opening hours, even how busy is, is, is it there in, in the yeah. restaurant or a shop, right? So even data that we don't have. So 
Well, and you, you can think about this, you know, uh, another way, which is Google is long-term incentivized to disrupt all those businesses where they are the primary traffic driver. So if, you know, if someone is searching for an optometrist, well, Google, you know, in, in the short term, right, they can list lots of optometrists and the ones who pay them get the, you know, the ad up top and then they do reviews and they do data. But long term, why doesn't Google just buy Warby Parker and enter the optometry business themselves and take all the margin out of that and just put Google glasses? You should get your glasses and contact lenses from Google. We're great at, you know, and then, then the next sector and the next sector and the next sector. And soon, you know, this is this is how sort of the, I don't know, um, <laughs> the world, you know, the, the imaginary worlds of like cyberpunk where there's four corporations that dominate the whole planet. That That's kind of how that comes about. And I don't think any of us want that. Yeah, I'll just uh, remind our participants that they can ask questions. Uh, you can ask grand questions at Slido. Just uh, enter the event code SEO ZAS and uh, there are already some questions so let's okay featured snippets yeah actually i wanted to ask you about featured snippets because i'm thinking that we have been helping google to actually dominate the market by provide, <laughs> yeah. providing them with uh, free se semantic data yep um, basically open data that other search engines would have to exactly scrape like how, how google was doing it maybe I don't know, 15 years ago, but then they found better way. They just told us that uh, there will be rich snippets and we can have this zero position or even better position, whatever, but we just need to provide them with the data. So what do you think about feature snippets? Do you think it's still, it makes sense to try to rank uh, at position zero and aren't we, the, aren't we cutting branch under us by providing the free data to Google this way? Um, yes, you are cutting the branch underneath you, but if you don't do it, one of your competitors will, yeah. right? So Google's created a prisoner's dilemma. They've basically said, hey, you don't have to provide us the featured snippet. We can go to hundreds of people on the web and get it from them. So the question is, do you want to lose out entirely or do you maybe want to be in there but not get any traffic and help us answer the question directly and potentially put yourself out of business, but in the short term, you'll get some money. That, that's a pretty awful deal, but you know, it's, it's sort of, it's Darth Vader in Empire Strikes Back. You know, we just have to pray that he doesn't alter the deal further. And I, I, I think frankly, um, right now, the way that I, you know, advise folks, I'm obviously not in the search world anymore, search marketing world, but you know, I kind of have this, um, framework in my head um, that I've drawn up a few times, right, where, where the mental model is, um, is ranking for this, even if you don't get the click, is ranking for this featured snippet valuable to your business? Does it influence potential customers and sort of help you, um, you know, control the market and, and help you get brand um, uh, value and those kinds of things, right? And if the answer is yes, then I would ask, well, are you going to um, be able to get traffic for this? And if the answer is yes, yeah, um, then you definitely go after the keyword. And if the answer is no, we won't be able to get traffic, you ask yourself one more question, which is, would I rather my competitor have it? Yeah. And if the answer is no, I don't want my competition to have it, then you prioritize that keyword, right? And you go after the featured snippet and you give Google the data and you hope that long-term <laughs> some regulation or something else helps, helps stop uh, Google from entering your market. Right, right. And um, hmm. all right, so now Google is introducing even more answers and exactly the, 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 the new feature people also ask about and, and related questions and so on. Right. So what do you think? Can we predict that there will be the search? Can we predict the search intent is actually aiming for zero click uh, features that people will either go to Google properties or or just get the instant answer, right? Can we can we somehow know for which which keywords this is likely to happen? Uh, not one hundred percent, but there's there's two things that you can do. So number one is most of the SEO tools out there. I know my old company Moz had one. I, I built it while I was there. Right, they, it has a um, a feature in the product where when you 
look for a keyword and you add a you know keyword plus country or region or whatever you know the crawler goes fetches that serp and then it tries to estimate the click through rate so it'll say estimated organic click through rate of 12% or 40% or 70% or whatever it is um, so you can use that estimated click through rate to help prioritize you know oh this has 10,000 searches a month uh, and 70% click through rate. So I'm going to guess there's 7,000 clicks available, which means to position one, maybe there's 4,000 clicks available. Okay, I'm, I'm going after that keyword. And then you can look at another keyword that has, you know, 10,000 searches available, but a 20% click through rate. Okay, I'm going to prioritize that one much lower. So that is one way to do it. The second way is to do it manually. So if you have the time and energy, especially for very important keywords, or when you're prioritizing your sort of top 500 list, I would go run those searches yourself and I would take a look and then I'd give them, you know, I might manually score them. Like, oh, there's only one, you know, whatever, one featured snippet here, or there's only one uh, piece, you know, item above the, the um, organic results, but it's very compelling or it's very uncompelling. And so I'm gonna, you know, kind of use my own um, judgment to make the call. I, I, I think, Look, SEO is not has never been a fully automated process. It still requires a lot of human labor, a lot of, you know, um, brain power. Yeah. yeah, manual brain power. And that's a good thing for us, for those of us in the industry, right? Um, which, which is not me anymore. But but you know, I think for for folks in the agency world, that's that's really good. Your clients need you to be able to answer that question. Yeah, actually, our market is. I mean, the, the smaller markets are probably. Uh, in advantage in, in comparison yeah. compared to the English uh, speaking markets and the large country markets because we don't have all for example in Slovakia we don't even have the featured snippets yet mm. in Czech Republic next to us they already have it but it's for really like low number of uh, searches but compared to the US of course it's this is like huge advantage but I think it's just coming they just don't have the model trained uh, right. as well right now so but they'll, they'll be they'll be introducing it. So. Yeah, it'll get there. That that's what we've seen in sort of every other feature with Google, right? Is that they they start it usually in you know English and they'll test it in like Ireland or something like that or or Australia and then it'll roll out to the U.S. and Canada and U.K. Right. And then it goes to France and Germany and Brazil and yeah, right. Japan, all that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have another question here about featured snippets. If you think they provide some value for businesses. Yeah, I think I mean they can provide value for businesses. It's it's up to you to determine if they can and how they can. So if you know, for example, somebody searches for best lawnmower, you know, if you can get the review site that um is is providing the featured snippet to Google to include your lawnmower in the first four or five items. That, that's a huge win, right? Um, you know, if somebody searches for uh, how do I get rid of, I don't know, um, bugs in my apartment or whatnot, and you're, and you can provide the featured snippet from your, um, you know, pest be gone <laughs> service or whatnot. Yeah, that, that can certainly, some people will just try the, few, the quick snippet that they get in Google, but many other people will click through um, so it's still valuable, but it, it's highly dependent. The, the featured snippet can sometimes prevent all click-throughs. Good example is birthdays. Mm -hmm. Tom Hanks' birthday. Mm -hmm. Someone provides a featured snippet or Google has the instant answer up there. Nobody clicks. You know, the click-through rate is nothing. I think we, I was looking with, with SimilarWeb early this year at the search for Donald Trump age or how old is Donald Trump? And Google has a little answer right, right up there. He's 75 or whatever he is. And nobody clicks. The click-through rate is less than 1%. Nobody clicks on the search result at all. But there are featured snippets like, um, you know, best gaming laptop. You know, there's a list. It's, it's a pretty hefty featured snippet. And still, the click-through rate is, just, is almost as high as it is for anything else because people have an intent behind that. They want to read more. They want to learn why those laptops are good. They might want to buy one of those laptops. So you, 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 you can find varying value. You, again, it's, it's going to be up here. Right. Um, we have some more questions about 
actually doing SEO. So if if you think you can answer some of them, <laughs> I'll I can I'll, ask. I'll do my best. It's okay. you know it's been a few years, okay, but I'll uh, let, I'll do my best. Let's try that. So, what do you think some enterprise sized websites should, should focus on? In, in Google or in SEO to how to increase their or organic visibility given the changes uh, Google is doing regularly, Google updates and so on, and the SERP changes and so on, so. Yeah, I, to be totally honest, I think one of the smartest things that you can do is to not put all your eggs in one basket, right? So look, Google can send you a lot of traffic but you're going to be competing with every single player in, in your industry, right? Everyone is trying to do SEO these days. It's not like it was five or 10 years ago. It doesn't matter how small your market is. It doesn't matter how unsophisticated they are. Almost everyone is playing in search rankings. And this is, that's really, you know, Daniel, when you and I started in SEO, it wasn't like that. You know, it was a wide open field, right? We, we yeah. saw millions of people searching and nobody trying to rank and nobody doing it right. But that's not the way it is today. Um, and algorithms were easier and we could wallpaper the first page. And so <laughs> yeah, you totally could. You totally could, right? You, you get enough links with enough anchor text, pointing to the right page. It's like, boom, you win. But but surely, let's let's talk more about the, the other channels. So yeah, it's now, not like that. I mean, many companies are now hugely depending on Google and on Google search, either organic or paid or even display and, and other options, Google Shopping. But what, what can they do to actually get less dependent on Google and prefer some other platforms? What, what should they be doing? Should they work more with their existing customers using, I don't know, some newsletters or, or social networks or trying other platforms that work for them? What, what would you recommend? What's your, what's your view of this? Yeah, so I think that um, the biggest unexecuted opportunity right now, that, because just far too few digital marketers play in this space, almost no brands invest in it, um, is essentially finding sources of influence that already reach your audience. That could be, you know, in an enterprise space, maybe, it, yeah, maybe it's an email newsletter, maybe it's an industry publication that's, you know, or organization, maybe it's a series of events or webinars, maybe it is a podcast, maybe it's a YouTube channel, maybe it's a, a Twitch stream, it, it could be thousands of things. And it's probably dozens or hundreds of players in each of those spaces. Mm -hmm. And the, the exciting part about that is that event, that podcast, that email newsletter, that um, person with an influential you know, social following in your space, if they cover you, endorse your product, um, have you on their, you know, have you on their webinar, right? Say nice things about what, what you're doing, that can have a huge impact at sort of top of funnel before someone ever gets to the search. And what is great about that is if you build up brand value here at the top of the funnel, when someone performs that search, when a potential customer comes to you and searches, they are more likely to search for your brand instead of the generic problem. They won't search for, you know, whatever, slip ring assembly for electrical engineering, right? They'll search for Oh, you know, Daniel slip ring, like right. boom, you, you rank number one, because they're searching for your brand. When I look at brands that have been built online in the past 10 years, you know, think of somebody like Airbnb mm -hmm. up until five years ago, they did no SEO. They didn't even try to rank for vacation rentals or vacation homes or, you know, homes for rent or whatever. None of that. They, they had zero search visibility, but because they built their brand, right? Because they built this, this new product, they built up the brand, they got great word of mouth, they got great coverage, they did a ton of PR. Brian Chesky in their right. earnings call last year talked about how PR was like the biggest thing they focused on. Because of that, there were more searches for Airbnb than there were for all other vacation rental keywords combined. Mm. How do you win? If you're somebody else and you're trying to compete with Airbnb and you want to compete on vacation rentals, what do you want to do? Do you want to rank number one for all the generic keywords? Or do you want to make your brand more searched for than all the generic keywords combined? Right. It, my opinion is brand building through digital PR and sources of influence um, and, and other people's audiences. That is the big untapped opportunity of today. And do you think that 
does does it mean that we have basically walked long way in a circle and came back to like traditional channels and and platforms and in a way in a way although the, i think the big difference daniel with you know today versus like 1990 or something is in 1990 there were a handful of gatekeepers in every industry today thousands right, right. Every, every person with a podcast, every person with a Twitter, uh, you know, popular Twitter uh, profile, every person with a popular LinkedIn page, every person with a, you know, a webinar that they run, there, there's just so many more opportunities than there were. And so many, and so many of those people are accessible versus sort of, you know, if you wanted to go to the big industry publication that cover, covered electrical engineering in Europe in 1990, you know, they wouldn't even talk to you if you weren't big enough. Right. But the, the YouTuber, the email newsletter, the podcaster, the webinar, the, the event series, the industry blog, they will talk to you. And how, how, how does it compare to Google in terms of budget? Do you think... <laughs> it's I mean, variable, super variable, right? So right, yeah. If you're doing this kind of marketing, right, where you're finding the sources of influence and then you're trying to pitch them for coverage or, or you know, advertise with them, sponsor them, do co-marketing with them, I don't know, run an event with them, it could be completely free, right? So you and I are doing an event right now. Right. Spark Toro isn't paying anything. Boston Digital isn't paying anything. We're, we're just... We're friends. We're doing an event together, right? Are, it's great. We are glad to have you here, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, and I'm thrilled to be here, right? But... But that costs nothing, right? right? It's just co-marketing and, and it's, it's great, right? That can work really well. Or alternatively, you can go find whatever it is, a YouTube channel that reaches people in the industry you want to reach that are right customers for you. And you can put that into your programmatic advertising, or right. you can reach out to that YouTube channels, you know, organization and, and, and uh, you know, click on their about page, find their email send them a letter, a note and say, hey, we'd like to sponsor your, uh, you know, your channel next month. What do, you, what do you offer, right? And you can pay them. So the budget is entirely variable. It depends. If you play it like, you know, a lot of people in SEO do link building, right? Mm -hmm. And link building is a lot like PR and pitching sources of influence. It's really similar. It's just the these are much more likely to get accepted than link <laughs> link requests. <laughs> Instead of, you know, email 100 people, get one link, email 100 people, get 95, you know, people saying, yeah, let's do something together. There, there's no penalty for emailing 100 people or talking to influencers, right? Yeah, Compared I mean, paid links. <sighs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You reach out to someone's email newsletter and you say, hey, I want to sponsor your newsletter. Google doesn't come in and say, oh, yeah, that's against the rules. It's not against the rule. That's how marketing works, right? Right. All right. I mean, um, I think our time's up. <laughs> so if you, if you have anything else that we haven't mentioned and you want to uh, mention it now, please do. Oh, sure. I mean, one thing I would say is I think that um, for anyone who is in search marketing right now, it is a uh, it is a very interesting time to explore these other channels, not only because they can provide traffic to you directly and, and you know, visitors and all that kind of stuff, but it also helps your search, right? It also helps your search rankings and the likelihood someone will click on you. Your click-through rate goes up as your brand gets built. Uh, it also helps your rankings because usually those things also result in links and coverage and brand mentions, which again helps your SEO. So look, it's not, hey, <laughs> this is a low risk effort and it fits very nicely together with the kinds of digital marketing that, that search marketers are used to doing. So I think, I think you know, that field, search marketing, has a specific advantage in this era going forward because they, you know, a good combination of technical and outreach and pitching and understanding the, the field and getting synergy from these multiple channels working together. It's a win-win. Cool. Well, thank you, Rand, for uh, being with us. It was a great honor to talk to you. And yeah, my we'll pleasure. have you here in our virtual webinar. And maybe next time you are in Europe, you can uh, get to Bratislava and uh, we can do some event live. 
And anyway, have a nice uh, vacation in California. And uh, let's hope we see some uh, more webinars with you and in uh, Central Europe. So that would be great. I again. can't can't wait to come back to Europe. Th Thanks for having me, Daniel. All right, again. take care, everyone. And I'll just remind everyone that we will be doing these SEO Zras events and webinars uh, in next few weeks with other people. There will be some presentations and there will be some uh, more discussions. So please follow us and, and you will see some more. And of course, this will be published on our YouTube channel. So you can uh, also share it that way. Thank you, Rent, once again. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.